The One Piece live action series has defied all expectations to become the first live action anime that actually isn't terrible. In fact, it was pretty good. And part of why it works so well is that the creators, Steven Maeda and Matt Owens, clearly love and respect the source material. And thanks to that, they've included plenty of Easter eggs in the series for fans like you and me to recognize. So here I go with the rundown of every single Easter egg that I somehow could find in the One Piece live action. Starting in episode one, where we get to see a familiar few faces presented at Roger's execution. The most notable here was a young Dracul Mihawk and of course a young Shanks, both of whom are very recognizable, let's be real. However, there's also this figure in a green cloak that we just have to assume is Monkey D. Dragon, the leader of the revolutionary army. We also got a blonde kid here who could be Smoker and barely got a glimpse of a young buggy as well. And this one here is a little bit less clear, but look at the jewelry on this woman. Is this crocodile? <clears throat> Did the live action just confirm the best theory? Croco mom? Well, we'll see. In the port, we can also see Mihawk ship here, a little cross-shaped raft. However, as we cross over to Luffy, we see him talking to a seagull, but not just any seagull, because this is a news coup, a certified delivery bird for the World Economic Forum, one piece's paper of record that operates worldwide. And on that newspaper, we actually see a headline about a war on Brock Coley Island, a war which will be ended by the German 66 two years from now. Then Roro Noazoro makes his appearance on Six's Island. Now, readers familiar with the Ace light novel here will know that this is the exact place where Ace was first stranded at the very beginning of his adventure. However, the much more obvious Easter egg was Zoro fighting against Mr. Seven of Barokward. And now some may be surprised to know that while it wasn't depicted in the manga, Zoro killing Mr. Seven actually is a very much canon event. That's because when the crew starts fighting against Crocodile's criminal organization during the Alabasta arc, we actually find out that Mr. Seven did in fact try to recruit Zoro, but was killed when he attacked the pirate hunter in the first place. And actually during this scene, Zoro also lights candles with matches from a matchbox that reads Beasts of Baltimore. Baltimore actually being the home of Dr. Vegapunk where Frankie trained during the time skip. Now in this flashback to a young Luffy hanging with Shanks' crew, we can clearly hear a very recognizable song for One Piece fans, which is Binks' Sake, which the crew sings along with Brooke to celebrate their victory at Thriller Bark. However, some fans have also speculated that this song is much, much more than just a certified party banger. Its lyrics might very well hide clues to the One Piece itself, so it's kind of an easter egg in an easter egg. And then as Luffy prepares to break into the marine base here, he speculates that he could maybe just fly into the base by hitching a ride on a bird. Now, this is a reference to how he made it to Orange Town in the anime when a bird catches his head in its beak and just carries him to the next island. And in Shellstown itself, we can actually see a buggy pirate in addition to the ones that Nami actually clowns out of their ship, previewing Buggy's triumphant introduction in the next episode. X and Morgan also brag about his defeat of Captain Kuro of the Black Cat Pirates, and we can actually see scars on Morgan that appear to come from Kuro's claw gloves. And then when Luffy and Nami steal Morgan's safe, we can actually see that its opening mechanism is the shape of the world government symbol here. Now, moving already into episode two, once the crew breaks open Morgan's safe, we also see Kuro's bounty poster, which Morgan has kept as a keepsake. And uh, speaking of bounty posters though, the live action Netflix team really put work into absolutely covering this thing with bounty bounty poster easter eggs. Because throughout the series, we can see bounty posters appear with the introductions of new characters, which is a reference to One Piece's so-called Oda boxes, which introduce characters and their bounties. However, we also see a lot of bounty posters for characters that have yet to appear in the series. Pirates such as Bellamy, Foxy, Cavendish, Don Creek, who we do actually see later in the story, Django, who we actually do not get to see in the story, and possibly some others that we might have missed. And actually, during Kabaji's monologue to Zoro about how in the live-action version of the story, Zoro killed his brother, he mentioned that the killing took place in the Goa Kingdom. Fans of the series will recognize that the Goa Kingdom is actually Luffy's home island and the island that houses Windmill Village here. Now, some fans may have been sad about some of the changes to the Orange Town storyline, despite the actor selection 
selected to play Buggy, absolutely killing it in the role. Now, Netflix evidently didn't have the budget for Richie, which is the giant lion, but they at least refer to him while Buggy is berating the lion tamer. In addition, we get to see the mayor of Orange Town and his incredibly recognizable hairstyle take on a new role among the rest of the enslaved townspeople instead of trying to actively fight back against Buggy. And the biggest change of this storyline is probably not getting one of the saddest backstory in the East Blue, and I'm talking of course about the little dog Choo Choo who diligently defended the pet store after his master died. However, towards the very end of this episode, we do actually get to see Choo Choo for a brief moment seeing off Luffy and co with the rest of the citizens of Orange Town. And I think things like this really show that despite needing to change parts of the blot due to time and budget and just restructuring things, the creators did really want to honor the hardcore fans of the One Piece fan base as well. And the final easter egg of episode 2 comes during Luffy's flashback just before Shanks gives him the straw hat. That's because we can see Whoop Slap, the mayor of Windmill Village, in an anime accurate costume and even though he didn't have lines in this version, they still made sure to include this fan favorite character. And in this scene as well, we see a crate from the Galilea shipwright company back on Water 7. And so now on to Syrup Village and episode 3. Here during Usopp's flashback, we can just barely see a poster announcing the death of Victoria Sindri, the famous actress who will eventually be made into a zombie corpse by Dr. Hogback on Thriller Bark here. Now on the title card for episode 3, fans who were disappointed by live action Usopp's lack of a actual long nose can rest assured that at least this recreation of Usopp's Jolly Roger has indeed a somewhat elongated nose. You know, at least longer than Jacob Gibson's nose here who is the actor who actually portrays Usopp in this version of the story. And in fact, the title card changes for each and every episode to reference a specific character. In case you didn't know, Oda has designed specific Jolly Rogers for all of the crew members, even if these images didn't appear in the actual series. Number one is the standard logo, which stands for Luffy. Number two features Buggy the Clown. Three again is Usopp's. Four is Zoro, prominently featuring the Wado Ichimonji. Five is actually not Sanji, but Zef. However, once we get to six, we do get Sanji's title card as well, whose skull has a swirly eyebrow, even though this version of Sanji does not. For episode seven, we get Nami's title card. And finally, for episode ace, we get Arlong's title card, which prominently features the symbol of the Sun Pirates here. This emblem of Arlong's former crew did not get as much focus as in the source material due to Hachan being absent from the live action completely. But anyways, back to episode three. Because as we rejoin the crew and see Nami studying the Grand Line map, we can see her trying to figure out what exactly is going on with Reverse Mountain. When Luffy then first sees the Mary, he claims that it feels like the ship is speaking to him, which feels like a very strong reference to the Klabautaman from Water 7, where the ship actually comes alive. Then when Usopp tells a story to Kaya, he actually mentions the Island Eater Goldfish, one of Usopp's many lies that will actually come true one day if the live action actually makes it to Little Garden. And while in Kaya's mention, Zoro could care less about the food, but much like his manga counterpart, really just wants to have a good drink. In the same scene, Usopp also tells a lie about the time that he slayed a dragon. It's a stretch, but this might be implying the existence of a very real dragon in the One Piece universe, such as the one that the crew fights on Punk Hazard or Luffy's future opponent, Kaido. And in the foyer of Kaya's mention, there are actually also these two penguin statues, which eagle-eyed viewers may recognize from one of Oda's cover stories. Zoro also states that he recognizes Kudo from Mirror Ball Island, and while Django is sadly absent from this adaptation, this island is a reference to where Django ends up in his cover story. And then later when exploring the rest of the mansion, we get the very first of many, many references to Zoro getting lost very easily, and it's really good to see that the Netflix version keeps Zoro's gag alive. And lastly for episode 3, Child Usopp's bandana in the flashback has the logo for the Usopp pirates who are the three kids who follow him around in the manga but who are completely missing from this adaptation. Which means time for episode 4 where our first easter egg comes on the very first shot. Because the bush behind the well is trimmed into the shape of a panda, marking Panda Man's official appearance in the live action. Though as we all know Panda Man is sneaky so perhaps he's hiding out elsewhere in the show as well. So if you saw him somewhere else let me know. Also Zoro being literally stuck in a well is very likely a reference to the frog in a well line that later Mihawk says to Zoro in the anime but also in the live action. Which brings us to Zoro's flashback and first off Kuina gives her full name as Shimotsuki Kuina. Now in the manga
manga, we know she's from Shimotsuka Village and the daughter of Koshiro, but it isn't until much, much, much later in the series that we find out about their ties to the Shimotsuke family of Wano. We actually also get to see the Shimotsuke family crest all over the dojo, just as we did in the original material. Kuina's father also mentions how rare the Wado Ichimonji is, which might be a reference to its status as one of the 21 great great swords, hinting at the power system behind the swords in One Piece. Then later, when trying to find his way back to the mansion, Zoro just runs into Luffy because of course he got lost once again, just classic Zoro. When the Straw Hats then sail away from Sarah Village, we hear an orchestral version of We Are, which is the first One Piece anime theme song, thus causing all One Piece fans everywhere to automatically burst into tears. And to end this episode, Usopp then reveals his first draft of the pirate flag, once again featuring Usopp's Jolly Roger from the manga. And actually, at the end, during the credits that show images of the East Blue map, we see the island of rare animals, home to fan-favorite character Gaimon, who makes an appearance here as well. However, we also see many other easter eggs in the credit maps after each episode. Featured locations include the Polestar Islands, home to Loketown, a reference to the Marines Commander-in-Chief Kong, Kumate Island, which featured in Buggy's cover story, the Oikot Kingdom, where Belmere found Nami and Nojiko, the Kozia Islands, where the Jerma Kingdom actually went to during Sanji's second backstory, and my personal favorite, after episode 7, you can see a sketch of Mumu, the giant sea cow used by the Arlong Pirates in the manga. On to episode 5. Now on the Barache, Sanji prepares a blue fin elephant tuna, which is the same species of fish that Sanji buys on Loketown in the manga. And now this isn't a One Piece exclusive easter egg, but during Mihawk's brutally badass introduction, when he slices up the ship, we actually hear a Wilhelm scream, a very famous stock effect that sound designers very much like to include in many films. And of course, the pirates that Mihawk is fighting are the Don Creek pirates, who are the original and antagonists of the Baratie arc in the manga, and we even still got to see Gin on the Baratie, as well as the defeated body of Pearl on the beach. Then Nami and Zoro playing a drinking game. Now this one is a bit of a stretch, but this could be a nod to the drinking game that Zoro and Nami play with the undercover Baroque Works agents on Whiskey Peak. Then of course when Mihawk meets Luffy, he actually recognizes Shanks' hat and immediately compliments it. Also in episode 6, when trying to think of Zoro's favorite food, Luffy states that he really likes rice bowls, which is a reference to Zoro's signature attack in the manga being called onigiri, which is the Japanese word also for rice ball. Then during Sanji's flashback, child Sanji actually has blood smeared on his cheek in a swirl pattern, a reference to his eyebrows in the anime, no doubt. Then later when Nami reads to Zoro, she tells him the story of Nolan the Liar, a very famous fairy tale in the One Piece world that actually serves as a fundamental part of Skypiea's backstory. Also, the pages of the book are actually manga accurate as well, right down to including another sighting of Panda Man. And at the end of the episode, we can also see another Galilea crate on the Going Merry. Then in episode 7, we see Belmare here turn a tangerine into a pinwheel, which sort of combines two important symbols from the manga. First off are the tangerine groves that Nami is associated with, but secondly, in the manga, the village mayor Genzo here wears a pinwheel on his hat to entertain the young Nami and Nojiko to appear appear less frightening to them. We actually do see him briefly in a flashback with his signature pinwheel, but this was a nice way to combine both of these symbols. It's a bit of a shame though that Luffy never gets to see the pinwheel and remark on how cool it actually is. Also, in the Netflix adaptation, Arlong Park itself is also much, much more notably modeled after a theme park with several carnival games seen on the premises. One of these being home to the ultimate prize, Buggy's Body. Making Arlong Park look a lot more like a theme park makes sense since later on in the story, we actually find out that Arlong modeled his entire empire on Saba Odi Park. That's the theme park on Saba Odi Archipelago that banned Fishman due to prejudice, which Arlong really wanted to go to as a child. Then Mezumi here also evokes the name of another warlord and future crewmate, Jimbei, and rightly, Arlong gets angry, foreshadowing the tension between the two when they were both members of the Sun Pirates. 
And during Zeph and Garb's meal, Zeph discusses dining on one of the last wild boars of Jaya, which is an island that the Straw Hats will eventually visit as part of the Skypea saga. Then episode 8 treats us to another fantastic Wilhelm scream during the Battle of Arlong Park. When the Straw Hats get the newspaper and see Luffy's bounty, Usopp's head appears in the poster just like it does in the original. And in the same newspaper, we also see a headline about the Revolutionary Army. Buggy and Alvida meet up in a bar, foreshadowing their future team up at Loketown and their future rise to the same level of Emperor as Luffy. Then when Garb talks with Kobe, he talks about how different Marines have their own brand of justice, a nod to the future Marine Admirals such as Akainu, Kizaru and Aokiji who have absolute justice, lazy justice and unclear justice. Then when the Straw Hats put their feet up on the barrel, we get a better look at Luffy's very controversial shoes in the show. We can see that the costume department actually put a pattern on Luffy's shoes that somewhat resembles sandals, which is a nod to Luffy's usual footwear. And when Nami's inspecting the map of the Grand Line here, she once again remarks on the odd geography of Reverse Mountain. Then we are plays again, sending the Straw Hats off into the next season of the show, and then in a post credit scene, we get a tease of Smoker burning Luffy's wanted poster, who many fans were really surprised not to see this season. So thankfully, it looks like the creators have not forgotten him. And then one Easter egg that is actually several Easter eggs combined comes in the form of the outfits that the Straw Hats actually wear throughout the season. Because practically every outfit that wasn't manga accurate came from one of Oda's color spreads that have the Straw Hats displaying peak fashion. But despite hiding so many details very loyal to the source material, the live action also had a ton of awesome and quite terrible changes compared to the manga and anime that you can watch all right here. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.